So I don't, I don't know whether show and tell is a proper part of, of a liturgy, but here goes. We're going to have a, we're going to have a little show and tell as, as part of the worship service this morning. Actually, this will mostly be the, the tell part because the things I have to show you are actually quite, quite small and it would be difficult for you to see where, from where you're sitting. Um, however, after the service this morning, I, I invite you, if you wish, um, if, if you find this interesting, to come forward and kind of take a look and you, can, and you can participate in the show part after the service. From 1938 to 1960, the American Unitarian Association published an annual Lenten Manual, and I've got one, what one of them looks like here. This is the one from, from 1950. Um, and what these were, were these were little, little booklets, little devotional booklets with a reading for each of the 47 days of Lent, beginning with a reading for Ash Wednesday uh, and then continuing on with the last reading uh, for, for Easter Sunday. Um, when the denominations merged in 1961, they stopped calling them Lenten manuals, um, and they changed the name to meditation manuals with the understanding they, they were, the readings were no longer broken up, you know, one for each of the days of Lent, but instead they were kind of to be read whenever you wanted through the year. Um, the Lynn Unger poem that Barbara read earlier at the beginning of the service was actually from the, the 1996 meditation manual. Um, and if you've ever been to a committee meeting with me or, or a class, you, you know that I often will, will select readings from these meditation manuals to read it be, before classes. So between 1938 and 1960, our religious forebears published some 41 different Lenten manuals, and, and I've collected more than a dozen of them. Um, and after the service, you're allowed, I've, I've got 10 of them there. Um, you're allowed to come forward and look at them, and, and hopefully there will be 10 of them when it's time for the second service. That's... <laughs> the Lenten manuals are each very different and represent the diversity that's found within our faith. The, the 1955 manual deals with the subject of peace, and each day's meditation begins with a passage from the Bible, and each day's reflection, inspired by that biblical wisdom, is on some aspect of peacemaking. The 1954 manual, entitled Taking Down the Defenses, begins with an Ash Wednesday reading by Carl Jung, and the Lenten period is imagined as an opportunity for Jungian self-analysis. And so each day is kind of this, this idea of, of how to self-analyze yourself, according to Carl Jung. It says, the, the preface, the manual is designed to help us meet ourselves face to face and take true account of what we find. Psychologically speaking, we go about heavily armored in defenses of our own creating, defenses which sever us from others and hide us even from ourselves. In the beautiful 1951 manual, each day includes a passage from the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of Luke and an interpretation of that biblical saying or story. It's everything is drawn directly from the Bible. Um, and this could not be more different than the previous year's Lenten manual, this one from 1950, in which the word Jesus does not appear. The readings for Ash Wednesday are from Muhammad and Henry David Thoreau, and the readings are from Zoroastrian scriptures, Albert Einstein, Confucius, Cahil Gibran, and Eugene V. Debs, among others. The scripture for Easter Sunday makes no mention of Jesus or Easter. Instead, it's a passage by John Steinbeck. <laughs> so there were different, different practices of Lent. Um, some of them are different than others, um, but some of them are really deeply moving, consider the 1943 Lenten Manual. It's entitled Faith Forbids Fear, which is a very Rooseveltian title. Um, a version of this one was distributed through the USO for soldiers and sailors abroad to, to give them comfort and sustenance of, of faith while, while fighting. The preface declares, this material has been put together with the sole purpose of providing sources of plain loyalty to an inherited faith, realistic, rational, and of proven effectiveness 
to nerve faltering wills and to renew the sense of power in hearts that are being sorely tried and tempted. These meditations are bold and courageous with titles like Through Rugged Toil and Wearying Fight, Manifest Duty, Responsibility for Freedom, and Without Shrinking. After we receive the offering this morning, my sermon is going to be about different ways that we might approach Lent as Unitarian Universalists. But these lovely Lenten manuals from our history from 60 and 70 years ago. I believe they help us to imagine different practices, different practices that are possible today within our own diversity. So how many of you found at least a little bit, a little bit interesting that the American Unitarian Association published Lenten manuals for, all right, you, you, didn't, you didn't look interesting, interested when I was telling you about it, so, so. You all were like poker face, and I was like, oh, my, did, you, did I blow that, or have I already lost you? I haven't even started the sermon, and I've lost you already. Right now, all around the world, people in Christian cultures are whooping it up big time. They're celebrating Mardi Gras and Carnival and Pancake Day and other festivals. They're celebrating now because this coming week, is Ash Wednesday, which marks the beginning of the Lenten season. On Ash Wednesday, many Christians will go to church services to have ashes imposed on their foreheads. Remember, you are dust, and unto dust you shall return, marking the beginning of a season of solemnity, self-denial, self-discipline that will last for the next six and a half weeks and conclude with with Holy Week, when Christians recreate the drama of the last week of Jesus' life, the procession into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the Last Supper, the betrayal, arrest, torture, and crucifixion of Jesus on Good Friday, and the resurrection of Jesus on Easter. And on Easter, this spirit of solemnity and sacrifice that pervades, pervades the next month and a half will, will lift and joy will return. Alleluia. Alleluia indeed. But before the bright return of joy and, and life and light, there is this shadow season, this Lenten season. And at the beginning of the sermon, I want to offer you a bit of self-understanding, a self-understanding that may explain why we Unitarian Universalists tend not to make a very big deal about Lent, um, and in fact, why, why many of us struggle with Lent. So I want everybody to do this. You don't, some of you are like, I'm not going to do it till he explains why. But, <laughs> all right. So, so this, this. Unitarian Universalism, we we descended from the New England congregational tradition. We're the descendants of the Puritans, and the Puritans considered this to be the perfect ideal expression of faithfulness. The perfect expression of one's faith, one's religiosity, was moderation and control, balance and equanimity. To be a good Christian was to be consistently virtuous in all seasons and getting too high or too low emotionally and spiritually was considered to be a threat to proper spiritual practice. Christians in New England even went so far as to ban Christian holidays because they worried that Christian holidays would tempt people to engage in emotional exuberance and emotional kind of lowness and thus get in the way of the ideal Christian life, which was even-keeled. For example, Christmas was banned in Massachusetts from 1659 to 1681. Anti-Christmas laws passed in Massachusetts Bay Colony included an act forbidding stores from closing on December 25th and a requirement for town criers to walk the streets of town on Christmas Eve, ringing a bell and chanting, no Christmas, no Christmas. (laughs) That's the truth. That's the truth. In fact, in fact, Christmas didn't become a school holiday until 1870. So all the way up until 1869, Christians in Massachusetts celebrated Christmas by going to school and going to work. 
keeping the same routine. This is important. This is not anti-Christian, but keeping the same routine was seen as the epitome of faithfulness. Lent was the same way. The suggestion of celebrating Lent in colonial Boston would have got you sent to the stocks or banished to Rhode Island. <laughs> so so what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that this levelness, this moderation we've inherited, makes us a little ambivalent about Lent. Even those Lenten manuals that I read from announce this ambivalence. The preface to the 1954 Lenten manual begins, Why a Lenten manual? Several have asked me on learning that I was preparing one, and I've asked myself the same. Surely if setting aside a period of daily meditation is a good practice, it should not be confined to a single season. The author later admits, if we, if we carry through faithfully for seven weeks, we shall perhaps find ourselves of a mind to continue this beneficial habit. Somewhere between is where I belong. Malvina Reynolds was a Unitarian. She was, she was a Unitarian. Now everybody go like this. <laughs> All right, there we go. To understand Lent, you have to understand this. Earlier this week, I, I had a great conversation with a member of our church who comes to this church from a Catholic background and engages each year in Lenten practices. And she told me, the first thing she told me was, one of my favorite things about Lent is there's this kind of a wave of emotion that goes into it. Those were her words. She, she writes, So we go through this somber preparatory season where we strive to be more compassionate, we remember Jesus' suffering and the plight that he went through. When this, that season ends, it brings you Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, the days of Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. And then after all this somber atmosphere and doom and gloom, like soft music slowly building, you have Easter, this day of great rejoicing. We have a giant Easter feast. It's quite symbolic to me, that out of tragedy, gloom, and doom, when everything looks bleak and there's no hope in sight, this great miracle happens. It's a great reminder that out of darkness comes light. It's also, it's also, she says, a bit of a disservice to the season to look at Lent separate from Easter. They need each other to be whole. One of the central practices related to Lent is that of self-discipline and self-denial. And so I'm curious, how many, how many of you grew up um, um, Catholic or Episcopalian or in a, in a Christian tradition where, where the practice of Lent was emphasized? Any, anybody? Um, and, and how many of you were expected either as, as children or in your adult life to give up something for, for Lent? What sorts, of, what, sorts of things did you, what sorts of things did you give up? Yeah. Bob? Candy? What? <laughs> root beer, root beer floats. Any, anybody else? What? what say what? Dessert, Dessert and oh, bubble gum. Bubble gum. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Gave up money, so there was a there was increased charity. Um, I should note that within within much of Christianity, the the emphasis on self denial has has been lessened, and many Christians observe Lent by extra acts of charity, extra community service, um, by other acts of kind of moral self-improvement. Uh, Pope Francis is fond of quoting John Chrysostom, who said, quote, No act of virtue can be great if it is not followed by advantage for others. So no matter how much time you spend fasting, no matter how much you sleep on a hard floor and eat ashes and sigh continually, if you do not do good to others, you do nothing great. In his Lenten message last year, Pope Francis challenged Catholics to give up indifference for Lent. To give up indifference. And so it is this idea that... that um, you can give up uh, coffee or, or alcohol or, or sugar, but there's also other ways of giving up as well. Uh, one member, or the member of our church who I spoke with, uh, um, gives up something for Lent each year and finds that practice deeply meaningful. And, and she told me that she has tried both practices of self-denial um, last year, giving up coffee and alcohol, 
as well as committing to kind of spiritual improvement. This year, she says she plans to give up complaining. Um, (laughs) She told me, quote, this year for Lent, I'm giving up critiques. I've noticed as I get older and more jaded and cynical, I've become a bit more of a naysayer and someone who points out flaws when things aren't exactly perfect. It's a habit I've fallen into just from going with the ups and downs of life. I accept this as something I don't want to have. And so for approximately 40 days, I will hold back. I'll try to hold back any negative opinions. I'll strive to reshape my perspective and thoughts to be more positive and not put my doubts and fears onto others. I have to confess, speaking personally, that as a Unitarian, I struggle with the idea of giving something up as self-denial, as religious practice. What's this, what's this all about, this sense of being religiously, setting, set, or being religiously set apart? The part of me, though, that struggles with it is also the part of me that seeks to rationalize religious observance, that looks at religious practice through an overly rational lens. And I think it's a mistake. I think it's a mistake to assume that religious observance has a rational logic to it. That's a trap that we fall into. Now, let me explain by this. Take, take Judaism, for example. We know in Judaism that there are Jewish dietary laws against eating pork. But, but why, are, why are there those laws? Does anybody think they know the reason for the, for the kosher laws? Anybody want to hazard a guess? What, okay, so we've got trichinosis, disease. How many people have, how many people have thought that, that, that that's probably the reason? So actually, this is, this is really interesting. Actually, this is, this is not the case at all. Um, and, and in fact... That we, we look for sort of a science, we look for a scientific reason for this practice. Um, the famous sociologist Mary Douglas did a deep analysis. I'm going I'm to get back to Lent, but just follow with me for a minute here. There's a famous sociologist Mary Douglas who did a deep analysis of Middle, Middle Eastern cultures, uh, Middle Eastern ancient cultures. Those cultures that shared a seven-day cosmology didn't eat pork and those that had a different cosmology, a different creation story for the world, did eat pork. And she points out that all these cultures, they lived very close together. And so it's not like one culture was really smart. It's like, ha, ah, we, we're not going to get trichinosis. And then the other culture, like the Sumerians just down the road who ate pork, it's not like the Sumerians were, it's not like they were dumb. But they had different cosmologies. And what Mary Douglas, this argument that she put forward, that's, that's been accepted, is that to be, in, to, be, to be Jewish or to be in one of those cultures with a seven-day cosmology, it was you lived your life, you ordered your life according to this religious story in which you found yourself. And so and part of that story was that God rested on the seventh day, and so you rested on the seventh day. Part of that story is that the days are separate, and you've got one day where water's created and fish, one day the air is created, one day land is created, and so you have purity of, purity of days, and so you eat fish, which are kind of pure water, and not shellfish, which have like legs, they're not, they're not fully land or fully ocean. You can eat birds, but not weird birds that don't fly. And you can eat the animals that are created with the, um, with the correct hooves and not animals that are created with, with incorrect hooves. And so, so following this is this actually living this story of the same way you have the, the Jewish injunction against blended, blended fabrics, against mixing wool and, wool and cotton, Right? You've got those, those you're, you're mixing your days of creation. You're mixing up the ordering of life, that you live life ordered to that. And so I think that this, this, idea, of, this idea of self-denial um, is not, there's, it's difficult kind of from a scientific or rationalist to sort of, sort of talk about that, but from this idea of conscientiously 
ordering one's life. The practice makes more sense. Lynn Unger writes, Forget sacrifice. Nothing is tied so firmly that the wind won't tear it from us at last. The question is how to remain faithful to all the impossible, necessary resurrections. The question is how to remain faithful to this story that we are living. It's a, this idea of, of giving something up self-denial is one that I struggle with. I was actually, I, I do this, this ritual on Sunday morning where on the way to church, I stop by the root cellar uh, to pick up a cup of coffee. Um, and, and when I went in there this morning, the, the, the barista at the root cellar, it was like, she was like half asleep there. Um, I, I always get funny reactions because I walk in with, with my shirt and tie and, and one day, one day the, the barista said to him, walked in on a shirt and tie on a Sunday morning, she said, oh, you have to go to work on Sunday morning, your boss must be a jerk. <laughs> I was like, nah, it's a pretty, pretty good boss, actually. Um, um, but, this, but this morning, this morning, she was, this morning, this morning she was really, she was really tired and kind of, and kind of flagging. And, um, and I said, well, you work at a coffee shop. You should, you should have a cup of coffee and perk yourself up. And uh, she said, oh, I'm, I'm giving up coffee. And I don't, I, don't think, I, don't think she, I don't think she's doing this as a Lenten practice. I think she's doing this as kind of an intentional reordering of my life. And it was everything to not to say, not to be, well, well moderation. You clearly need some coffee now. Maybe, maybe don't try to give it up entirely. Maybe try to moderate it was, it was all that I could do. Not, and I'm like, I'm preaching this message this morning. And that was my first thought was to go to this. <laughs> There's other ways. There's other ways to order our lives with intention. Last year, um, a group of Unitarian Universalists who are, who are interested in kind of creative spiritual practice they um, decided to launch a Lenten practice that was every day for the 47 days a day of mindfulness. Saturdays were days of service, but a day of mindfulness. And they had this, this website where, where every day there was a theme that you were supposed to be mindful of throughout the whole day. And you actually were supposed to, with your, with your cell phone camera, take a, take a picture of where you observed peace or beauty or hope and to, to structure one's life around mindfulness. Um, check, my, uh, check my Facebook page this, this week, because I'm, be, I'm going to be taking up that challenge of stepping out to try to actually model a, a, daily, a daily mindfulness over the next six weeks. Lent, whether we are interested in it, drawn to it, fascinated by it, whether we're a little bit ambivalent about it, whether it, it hits some part of our past that, that we love or some part of our past that, that we kind of thought we'd left behind. Lent is about this intentional, intentional ordering of one's life to participate in a story of faith. And so we should be, we should be glad for all of those who take up a practice of intentionally ordering one's life according to the story of faith. And we might learn a thing or two from it as well. Thank you.